Coming up on Tech News Today, Yahoo names a new CEO. We'll give you the name and what it might mean next. Also, Roku's got a streaming stick. They're trying to worm their way inside of televisions. And Microsoft's prepping a Windows Phone marketing blitz. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, January 4th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle most any used electronic gadget from your home or office. Don't just sell it, gazelle it. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And joining us today from Channel Flip, Mr. Will Harris. Welcome back to the show, Will. Hey, Will. Full with Halo. Hello. Good night. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's good to, good to have you in 2012. Also still rocking the Christmas sweater. The jumper. Ah, the jumper. Yeah. It's looking the good. Christmas jumper. Holiday jumper. Absolutely. The holiday jumper. Exactly. <laughs> to be worn on holiday. Right. Uh, but today's not a holiday. we got tech news for you. The very best tech news we could find, so don't blame us. Yahoo <laughs> has named a new CEO, Scott Thompson, uh, the PayPal boss. Uh, he was the president of eBay's PayPal business. Will take over Monday as a board member of Yahoo as well as CEO. Uh, the CFO, who had been filling in as CEO of Yahoo, is now going to go back to being CFO. Uh, and boy, is he relieved. Interesting to note, Thompson was hired at PayPal by Jeff Jordan. Jordan is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, who is reportedly among those working on a bid for a stake in Yahoo. Okay. So wheels within wheels there. Uh, but yeah, Scott Thompson is probably not the guy you pick to head Yahoo if you're going to sell it outright. So it, I, I think the Andreessen Horowitz takes a stake. Yang continues with control. Thompson's the CEO and a board member. That looks to be the direction uh, that this is going. Uh, they had a, a call today for analysts to, to listen in and meet the new CEO. We've got a bit of that call that we can play for you. Thompson was introduced uh, by the board chairman, Roy Bostock. Thank you, Roy. And hello, everyone on the call. I'm very excited to join you all today. And I'm just thrilled about the opportunity to deliver Yahoo's next era of success. Yahoo is an industry icon. Its people represent one of the great teams in the online world. And it has so many strengths and assets to build on, including its continued leadership position in the internet with top sites and more than 700 million unique visitors worldwide. I fundamentally believe that Yahoo's future depends on its ability to create great products and an integrated, compelling customer set of experiences. So if you want me to pick between products and content, I'm not going to. I just He's also took saying job. Yahoo. I, I like that. Do I used you? to say Yahoo until I was mocked by my It doesn't bother wife. me. I think he's got a nice voice. Uh, he's not really saying anything uh, yeah, outstanding, outstanding here. Yeah, not saying anything there. He did, he did do an interview with All Things D. Uh, he said Yahoo's potential is enormous, but the dialogue has not been about what the company is. I want to get this wonderful brand to where it could be again. So as a starting point, this is a great starting point. He's trying to turn it around saying, look, you got 700 million uniques. you got a lot of visitors. you got a lot of great products. But nobody's talking about what is Yahoo? What is Yahoo supposed to be? And that's where he's going to start. Well, on that same call, Bostock, he's the chairman, is that correct? Chairman of the board. Yeah, he said that, that Yahoo's going to he's gonna be public because it's still too pricey to take private. Now, if, if uh, Thompson goes in there and, and goes and sells off the other assets, maybe it can go private again. But, I mean, since, they, since Yahoo's went ahead and named a CEO like this guy, and it seems like eBay has is like a farm league. I mean, it was, it was Whitman moved over to HP. She was eBay. And now this guy's from PayPal, which is owned by eBay. So if you want to... eBay would appreciate that. If you want to... Well, look, look, that's Kansas I mean, City Royals. CEOs move around a lot. Though. Well, yeah, what I'm saying is, I mean, apparently PayPal and eBay have what it takes for what people hope to be the future. I mean, can Thompson turn around Yahoo? I'm thinking if he divests themselves of a bunch of things, the call obviously didn't say anything, which I think was a smart move. Instead of saying, I'm going to come in there and I'm going to be a firecracker, it's going to be like Larry Page all over again. Everything's going to be shifted. People might be freaking out. But, I mean, a direction 
with somebody is, is a good start, I think. Scott Thompson at least comes off of a successful run um, building PayPal's business. Really good numbers that people can look at. It's not as if they just hired somebody where people go, well, gosh, you know, PayPal's kind of in the toilet, too. What's this guy going to do at Yahoo? Maybe but, he's got something up his sleeve. Yeah, but on the, on the other hand, he was, like, he's a pretty an interesting character because he is, like, really heavily, like, CTO-ish. Like, mm -hmm. Yahoo is a really, you know, basically a consumer. It's a consumer internet company. And this guy was, like, a CTO for PricewaterhouseCoopers, CTO for Barclays, CTO for PayPal before he, you know, got promoted up to CEO. Like, he's really heavily technology. And when you hear him talk about, you know, we're going to return to a path of, like, innovation with amazing products and those kind of things, it, it, it's all sort of couched in the language of we're going to build, like, really cool technology. But to my mind, Yahoo isn't really like a technology company anymore. It's like, it's like a consumer brand. You know, it's content. So I'm not really sure how much of a, like, a great fit this guy really is. Well, Terry Semmel very much took Yahoo towards that direction you're talking about, it being a brand, being a content player, uh, being about delivering information. And Jerry Yang has shown signs of wanting to take it back towards being a technology company. That explains why he wants Thompson. But I think you raise a very valid concern is whether that is the best idea for turning Yahoo around. You've got Google, the pinnacle of being an engineering company and a, a product-based company, right now saying we need to do fewer things. Uh, we need to focus and we need to do things well. Yahoo it sounds like they may start to just throw a bunch of ideas out there. I think that would be the worst thing they could do. I mean, you really think that? I, I don't believe that that uh, Yahoo. I'm thinking Amazon already. Uh, I don't believe that Yahoo is going to be continuing its path. I mean, the thing is that I don't see them expanding any further. I think this this idea that they would be a tech company. There, there were some moves that seemed like okay, Yahoo wanted to be a brand that you got on your iPad, right? You get the live stand applications. You get these things to, to actually aggregate their content. So you actually know where to go for Yahoo content instead of being like, is this over here? Is this the AP? Where is this? I think, I think that with, with Thompson, there's a good chance we're going, we're, going to, we're going to see focus for once. Instead of, instead of focusing on a sale, which I don't think is going to happen now. Of course, it shouldn't be happening now. They will actually go, look, what are we again? We're the premier digital company. And, and Thompson's going to be like, no, 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 no. We have to actually have a real tagline. Well, they you sell know? ads, too. What, what does Thompson know about that business? I don't know. You know, that's a, that's the, being a content company means they're making their money selling ads. I think I think the thing is, it's really interesting that they didn't really take this opportunity to do anything like radical. Like you could have appointed somebody that really sent like a message about something, um, and you could have done it in a way you know that coordinated with Andreessen and Horowitz. We're going to do some kind of private, you know, as much as as much as Bostock says, you know, it's too expensive to take private. It's not too expensive to take private. There's plenty of people who are prepared to put up the money to do that. So I think it feels to me right now like this appointment is a little bit like uh, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Or like, you know, not deck chairs, but rearranging the captain's chair. You know, chief navigator <laughs> twirling, is still like... Twirling the still, captain's chair twirling, around. You're, you're yeah. still heading straight into it. All right. So it kind of doesn't really feel like uh, like the sort of turnaround that I would want to see from Yahoo. Meanwhile, PayPal in the, in the news for other uh, reasons. Uh, Regretsy posting the story of someone named Erica who sold a violin through PayPal. The violin had been authenticated by a top luthier uh, to be a valuable violin valued at $2,500. That was the selling price. The buyer took issue with the label. And apparently, I don't know anything about this, but according to the blogs I've read, that is a normal issue with older violins. People will take issue with the labels. It doesn't mean they're inauthentic. Even Stradivarius uh, violins will sometimes have controversy over the label. So they contacted PayPal about returning the violin. PayPal said they would refund the money if the purchaser destroyed the violin and showed evidence. And so that's what the person did. And they got their money back from the woman, Erica, yeah. who sold Erica the violin. Erica lost $2,500. So she said, yeah, well, she didn't, she didn't really lose money because she just, now the violin's gone. Well, she lost the violin. Right. That's right. But that's the th it's it, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why why is that the only way that a uh, transaction can be reneged? Well, it's on? not the only way. In fact, Regretsi has a, a highlight up of the actual uh, terms of of returning from PayPal. If you recall, Regretsi ran into PayPal's donation policy at the end of last year. And in the terms, they say, to comply with PayPal's shipping requests, one of the things PayPal may also require you to destroy the item and provide evidence of its destruction. It's not the only one, but they may do that. Now, there is a reasonable 
uh, there's a reasonable justification for having this. It's for it, counterfeit yeah, goods. Yeah, if I sell you a fake Louis Vuitton bag, yes. you get it and you realize it's fake and mm -hmm. you've been told it was real, then you can complain and PayPal's not going to want to facilitate counterfeiting, so they're going to say, look, we'll give you the money back, but you have to destroy the counterfeit bag. You can't return it to the counterfeiter to sell again. That's... Well, this, this is, is not exactly what was going on with the $2,500 violin. Not at all. There was something on the label that the purchaser didn't like and said, ah, I'm not comfortable with this. But why did the purchaser destroy the violin? Because they, PayPal asked them. They said, look, it, because that's a counterfeit it, yeah. violin, so you have to destroy it, and then we'll give you the money back. That's terrible. Well, theoretically, if, if this person had sold, if Eric had sold like a $12 toy violin to this person, if they just, and they said, look, you want this refund, destroy that $12 you know, piece of junk. People wouldn't be freaking out about this. It looks like PayPal's stuck in a bunch of, like, we're following rules, we're following rules. We don't care about the fact that this might be a $2,500 item or this is a, 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 it's a, it's from, it's from World War II. At least that's what the seller is saying. This is an old piece of, of, a, of, of a musical instrument, that is. So if they're not going to look at every special case, I mean, it just seems like policy-wise, it would be another administrative nightmare. Let's double check the authenticity of every single device or everything sold mm -hmm. through PayPal. And PayPal makes how many transactions per day? Could you imagine that if every single time that they, there was a return, that this wasn't an option? I mean, I, I'm just thinking of the administrative other side. Now, granted, if this is, if this is an authentic uh, instrument, this is a really horrible thing to happen to it. But I think it's horrible. Like, as a musician, you just go like, that is just insane. Like, as far as I understand it, like, the woman who bought it wasn't even denying that it what necessarily was authentic, just that, like, the, the, the labels and things weren't in the correct condition. And it just seems like, you know, this and the, the regrets, the donation thing from, you know, the end of last year, like, you just got to think, like, does PayPal employ anybody with any common sense whatsoever? Like, now, common sense people. Somebody in the chat room uh, brought up something interesting. If PayPal only asks for, like, a picture of the destroyed mm -hmm. evidence, could you have had some Something that was a cheap, uh, a, a Destroy fake a cheap of what you actually Pull did buy. Pull the label out, put it on the cheap Take one. Take a picture, get some money Go back. Go fence the valuable. Now one. that's a conspiracy that, theory. Exactly, yeah, we don't but have I mean, the whole thing is just a weird story anyway. I don't know. I'm sure that has happened before. Well, apparently these violins are overpriced anyway because in a totally unrelated story, Ars Technica uh, reports that the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences will be publishing a paper wherein researchers uh, surveyed 21 experienced violinists in a blind test to determine whether they could tell a Stradivarius from a new violin, and they couldn't. Now, this isn't a definitive study, but it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that'll totally devalue every single classic instrument out there, including you know, all kinds of guitars and pianos and violins, right? Because you know, craftsmanship is, is pointless nowadays. Well, the th isn't, isn't it just knowing that you have this... Well, they, rare, they, authentic violin that's part of the reason that these cost so much. You don't necessarily, yeah, it's like... the pimposity of it. I mean, if you close right. your eyes and it feels like another violin that's cheaper, yeah. well... It's like every collectible, though. I mean, like, yeah. okay, like, why is Action Comics worth so much? Number one. You know why? Because not a lot of them made it to now. You Just know, because you can enjoy the story on a digital version doesn't mean it's the same thing. Stan Lee autographed several comics with this pen. Oh, yeah? I'll sell it to you. Yeah. Destroy the pen. Destroy the pen. <laughs> Where's this? Let me see the little tag on it. All right. Now, there's, let's, this, this is silly. Let's move on to Microsoft and Nokia. Uh, rumors all over the place that they're going to spend $100 million, $200 million on marketing. Paul Therott at WindowsITPro.com says, oh, hell no. They're going to spend a lot more than $100 million. Uh, Microsoft... And Nokia, according to him, I emailed him to get some clarifications. Microsoft and its partners will spend almost $200 million on marketing in the U.S. in the first half of 2012 just on AT&T. Uh, and the partners include Nokia, HTC, and Samsung. So Nokia is going to be spending money also on T-Mobile in January, Verizon in April. Uh, the, the Lumia 710 is going to come out uh, around that time. So there'll, there'll be, there's going to be a lot of money being thrown around. They want to convince consumers to purchase millions of Windows phone handsets in the first half of 2012. They're trying to juice that number up once they launch all these phones with Nokia. And they're actually going to be giving retail workers incentives of 10 to $15 to sell Windows phones. Now, now, Paul also in an email to me said that these amounts are attached to specific units sold, so it gets better as they sell more. The $10 figure requires a minimum number of units sold per month. Uh, so you can't just sell two Windows phones and get, and 20, get 20 bucks. Bucks. You have to be pushing a lot of phones. Uh, but, but again, Microsoft paying commissions to retailers to guide you towards a Windows phone.
I mean, it's not that surprising considering how little market share Windows Phone has. Now, with Microsoft working with Nokia and Nokia claiming every now and then, we have the first true Windows Phone. And this Ace version is supposed to have the front-facing camera, running Tango, all kinds of things that the actual Windows Phone is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this fantastic OS. And now, I think it's actually mature enough that pushing it this year, in 2012, there's a chance they'll make some inroads. And they need to do a marketing campaign because people see the ads and they're like, what is that? They have no idea. People don't really care about operating systems, I, th I believe, in, mobile, in the mobile space, the general public. So when it comes to Nokia and, and Microsoft working together to get these phones out there, Nokia made a big gamble. They need this to, to, to work. Microsoft needs market share. I mean, I guess I'm... I'm not surprised by 200 million bucks. It just seems to be localized in, at AT&T. Well, Microsoft is also well aware that they they do they do well when they're they they've got their software with the masses, right? So their problem is is like, okay, we need incentives for people to just buy these handsets in the first place. Well, I if, think it's I think it. Sorry, sir. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I think it's interesting because um, you know I, I don't think it's I don't think Windows Phone has got a problem with consumers. I think it's got a problem with the retailers. And that and, and the and the networks because um, you know as I understand it and bear in mind I'm just parroting everything I heard from Paul Throttle on Windows Weekly a couple of weeks ago um, they you know Microsoft does not pay enough money and does not give enough latitude in terms of commissions and handset prices and in terms of the flexibility for um, software updates and that kind of things to people like AT and T and that has really sort of annoyed AT and T and other carriers and meant they haven't really pushed it so I think actually this is not really a consumer charm offensive. It's it's actually like a retailer and network charm offensive because at the end of the day, it's those guys that are selling the phones. You know, you can either say that retailers are selling phones or consumers are buying them. I think Microsoft is sort of looking at it in the, in the first way. Well, either way, Microsoft's going to be spending a lot of money. How successful do we think that they're going to be by, you know, by June, by, by summer? Uh, are they going to have ra raised that 5% market share enough to justify 200, 400, you know, 700, well, close to a billion dollars. Let's say the hot Android phones came out last year was with the Galaxy Nexus. The iPhone's not expected till what now, like September? So, I mean, Microsoft's got a lot of time. And I, I mean, I've been saying 15% for this year is where they're going to get, get to. I think with this kind of offensive, probably 10% by the summer. 10%. Will, you got a number you want to throw out there? I'm going to say the total amount they'll spend in the first half of this year will be $1 billion. And market share? Oh, no more than six percent. No more. They're, so they're not even going to raise it a percent with all that billion dollars. Oh, they might make it one. Make it six and a half. Oh, wow, <laughs> Sarah. I just keep I, I keep remembering like the last time that Microsoft seen that I can remember um, a big marketing push that people were really jazzed about was Windows ninety five. Now I know that's a long time ago, and a lot of things have happened since then. Yeah, okay, but that's less of a like for everybody consumer device. I guess. Okay. Um, and you know, we're, and we're and I'm mixing software with hardware here, but f f that at the time seemed like something new and fresh and different people had never seen before. And this just doesn't seem like that to me. This seems like a very interesting phone with a really great operating system, but not something that people are going to go, "Well, I had no idea I could do this with my phone." Just a different way to do it. So I'll say ten tops. I'm going to say seventeen percent by June first. Okay. I like that. So uh, let's etch that in stone. Precise. Hold me to that chat room on June first anniversary show of Tech News today. Remind me, market share of Windows. Somebody table. has to do it uh, following the prices, right? Uh, so I'm going to take one dollar. <laughs> and you guys are all going to go over, and I'm going to win. I doesn't appreciate even that. make any sense. I know it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll win probably win. somehow. It's going to it's going to rely on the hardware though. We're saying they'll be profitable. Uh, one dollar. We'll make one dollar. <laughs> something we... something folks might have missed over the break. Three LTE based Windows Phone handsets will be coming uh, first half of this year. The Nokia Ace, the HTC Radiant, and the Samsung Mendel, which I assume allows you to cross. Punnett squares and peas or something. Uh, they will ship on AT&T wireless before the middle of 2012. And in fact, the Nokia Ace is due March 18th, uh, 2012. That according to Paul Therott as well. Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Gazelle.com. Great way to sell uh, used gadgets. I, I've been talking all week about how I've been selling my MacBook Pro, an old model from 2009. Uh, I, I took it, uh, went online. 
You look up the model number. You say, oh, I've got the cords. I've got the box. I've got the, oh, I don't have the CD. And they say, this is how much we can pay you. Uh, and then you print out a label, slap it on the box, send it in. In fact, I don't know how often they do this, and I don't think they knew it was me because I used a different email address. But uh, I, I, w I got a valet service. So last night after work, I dropped by FedEx. I handed them the MacBook Pro. I said, hey, this is, uh, this is going to Gazelle Returns. They looked me up, said, yep, got it, no problem. We'll pack it up and send it for you. Uh, and now I'm able to track it online. You can actually track to find out where it is in the process to know when they get it uh, and, and when they'll be sending you your money. They can send it by PayPal. They can send you a check. Uh, they can send you an Amazon gift card, a Walmart gift card. Uh, you can even have it donated to charity if you want. And if your gadget's not worth anything, they'll take it and recycle it responsibly. If you're selling something like a laptop and you're like, well, wait a minute, I'm worried about my data on there. Do I have to run Derek's boot and nuke on this thing before I send it off to make sure that it's, you know, really deleted? You might want to do that anyway, but Gazelle actually uh, guarantees that they will securely delete all data uh, from any of the devices they get. So check it out, gazelle.com. Get some extra cash for the old gadgets you've got lying around the house uh, and, and, and help you feel better about cleaning up and recy recycling or reusing, sending gadgets out to be reused. Great way to help the earth. Go to gazelle.com. See how much they're worth. Uh, gazelle.com. Don't just sell it. Gazelle it. We thank them for their support. Of tech news today and a bunch of tv stories tv related stories today uh, everybody pretty excited about roku announcing a new product that'll be coming out later this year second half of 2012 called the roku streaming stick i can't say i'm in love with the name they might want to come Sounds up like with another pregnancy name by test or <laughs> you, yeah so you just pee on Sorry. the stick and it streams all your favorite television shows uh no it's a flash drive size <laughs> dongle <laughs> that plus, if 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 you're going to like the show, it will stream it. Right. Uh, if not, it just gives you. Uh, it doesn't connect. Different line. Little pink line. Uh, the Roku streaming stick's a flash drive size dongle that plugs into the HDMI port on your television, and it uses something called Mobile High Definition Link. You probably haven't heard about this, uh, but it's a protocol that allows you to control a device remotely. It's meant for hooking up cell phones to televisions. But it allows you to control the device with a remote control without having to do anything else. So the streaming stick has Wi-Fi in it. It has this mobile high-definition link. You plug it into the HDMI port on the back of a television that is MHL enabled. And then you can use your remote to use Roku. You don't have to have a set-top box. Pretty, I mean, I've heard nifty. of MHL or this, this interface because I think this is one of the small features in the, the Galaxy Nexus. This is something you can do. You can hook up your phone to that. And I think, I mean, it's a, it's a smart idea, but I'm kind of curious about how many TVs at this point don't have apps. I mean, Samsung, I think they just opened up their API for their app, their app whatever well, they call their thing. And you have to have a TV that's MHL enabled. And there's like so those are going to be MH, older TVs. Yeah. A Toshiba line, the Regza, and Samsung's uh, UN55D8000YF, and a couple others in that, that line. I think yeah. the, the coolest Catchy thing names. about this, this uh, device is that it doesn't need another power supply. Because of the MHL standard, it's, you just plug this thing in, and it's going to be powered that way. It's got Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. so you can you get... Also, I'm, I'm very curious, but I don't like using Wi-Fi for my streaming video devices. It's just my own personal preference if you want to get the best bit rate i don't find that with wi-fi so i mean even though technically i think n should be able to support this kind of uh this kind of bandwidth i just don't find that to be the case if there's weird interference not at my house so that's why i, li I like the the old ethernet port kind of stuff on this but the, the the lack of power supplies the lack of things hanging off in your uh, you know hanging off your television no extra cables and things i think it's a very neat appearance it's a nice move towards something bigger for roku but it seems like a, a stopgap kind of solution what I can't work out is, like, how many, like, if you need this MHL technology to actually make it work, like, how many TVs are modern enough to have MHL but not modern enough to have apps? Well, I think the idea here is that Roku wants to get this bundled. In fact, it's going to be bundled with Best Buy's house brand insignia TVs so that the Best Buy doesn't have to build in a bunch of apps mm -hmm. or sign on to some system that they don't control. They get Roku to do it, and they don't have to change how they build the TVs. They just have to have them MHL enabled, which that's easier than building up a whole system of apps. Plus, and Roku I already has relationships where they have... Roku apps that no TVs have built in. Uh, the Twit Network, for example. You know? I think that what Roku wants to do is become the platform for televisions. And this is their way of convincing television manufacturers to do it, saying, look, plug this thing in and it's easy. You can bundle this with your televisions that aren't connected and don't have an app platform, 
I mean, yeah, Sony's got Google TV. Samsung's got their own uh, SDK out there. So they're not likely to get a lot of pickup there. But they may get pickup from lower level places. Maybe a Vizio might get on board with something like this. And then they can prove themselves and hopefully convince others to bring them in. And then they become the platform. I would love Roku to be the platform for apps on a television because I think they're great. I mean, funnily enough, isn't this what people were thinking the Apple TV is going to be? You, you were talking about this. It's like, well, plug in this device, and then the TV has... That's been one of the, one of the rumors. One of the versions, sure, and Roku's actually done it already. They're like, look, we have a plug-in device, and here's our UI, and we don't need necessarily even have contracts with the TV makers. It just has to have MHL, which is supposed to be a standard, which it actually uses different connectors, which is kind of a strange thing, too. So assuming that you have the MHL-enabled connector on your television... And you want the Roku experience. I mean, it's... Well, it's, it's just an HDMI connector. Well, you can use multiple kinds of... MHL can. Yes. But the, the Roku device is right, just HDMI. HDMI. You just plug it in the HDMI port. I mean, I mean, am I the only person who thinks it might be weird to see a little dongle sticking out of the TV? It's on the other side. You will never, you'll never see it. But what if you have your TV up against the wall? Side port. It's thin enough. Then you're going to see it off the side. Cover it in a nice doily. All right. You've got hang, the answer hang, for everything. Hang your remote control from there when you're not using it. Yes, use it as an extra <laughs> coat hanger. Put a plant. A Christmas perhaps. ornament yeah. that I'm not using the rest of the year. Uh, CEO Anthony Wood of Roku said that uh, will likely cost between $50 and $100, so it's in the same price range as the Roku boxes themselves. Like I said, ships in the second half of 2012. So we'll keep an eye on it. I, I think it'll probably be somewhere at CES, so we'll try to get a look at it there. Hopefully a working model. <laughs> Speaking of uh, television service talk, Scott Martin at USA Today has a write-up about what to expect from TVs at CES and most of the articles about Apple. Uh, because Will not be at CES. All, yeah, exactly. They won't be. And they have no intention of Starting uh, putting out a TV as far as we know. It's just all rumor. But uh, he does say that uh, Paul Gagnon at Display Search thinks that an ITV is going to happen, but it's at least a year away because they would have to have panels being manufactured for them right now, and there's no evidence that they're doing that. Uh, but even if an Apple entry into TV didn't happen until 2013, it could still garner $19 billion in sales. Uh, they're probably looking at a 42-inch or larger LCD TV with built-in Wi-Fi, uh, and apparently, according to this article, inside Jonathan Ive and Ive's lockdown studio at Apple, uh, there is a 50-inch version of the TV. But the point of all of this is not really to turn up all the Apple rumors again, so much as to say CES television producers are going to be positioning their televisions against Apple, with Apple not even having an announced product of any kind. They're going to be trying to say, look, we have the solution before Apple does. Apple may never come to this market. We have what you want. Uh, Samsung's going to be showing voice and motion technology to interact with TVs. Everybody's been talking about Siri being the way you interact with an Apple TV. Maybe Samsung can imitate Apple before Apple comes out with the product. Well, LG already has a remote control that does motion sensing, and it has a, a voice recognition thing. It came out, I think, like a couple months ago. Uh, so, I mean, the fact, th this is something that, that uh, since, like, the Wii hit, people are like, oh, I could use my remote this way. And there have been other, like, there's the loop, which allows you to use motion control as well to, to remote, use, your, use as a remote. But, I mean, this talk of this Apple TV thing, I'm reading the USA article, and it keeps the USA Today article. And it's like, there's a slick 50-inch television in his office. It's like, couldn't he just have a TV? I mean, there's, is it any shock? I mean, we have TVs in here all the time. We're not making one. All right. I know Apple's a different kind of situation, but the thing is... It's it is not, his design it's, studio. Wait, it's not I mean, impossible. I think that's a little that's, different. Well, you couldn't rip off a bezel, that, right? You couldn't not have making a TV. What was that? Can you confirm or deny? <laughs> <laughs> Twit is definitely not maybe making a television with apps. Listen, oh, this, I, I think you're definitely making it. The idea that <laughs> this one, year one at CES office. might be all about TVs that are designed to compete with the mythical ITV that won't be coming out for, let's say, another year, that is what Apple actually loves. Because yeah. then Apple waits for all these products to come in, people are used to the market, and then they're like, now here's our beautiful, different way of doing things that's a little bit prettier, and then people go, ah, and there's, Apple's almost never first to the game on this kind of thing. Yeah, very true. I mean, the so iPhone... sounds perfect for them. The iPhone's really like a really, really slick version of the Palm OS. I mean, if you think about it, Palm had... Okay, look, I have a, a touch screen and I have these icons and I have apps on my in my hand. It's a brilliant idea. But when you execute it right, it's going to look better. And the thing is, these, these connected TVs, I mean, this has been around for a while. I mean, they usually have Ethernet or they have Wi-Fi or you can use whatever. But like... It's so fragmented because each manufacturer has their own store. Like there's Samsungs, there's there's Vizios, there's Roku now in this thing, and, and you don't you don't really know what television will have what application and how long they will bother to continue updating that stuff. And that's why I still think with Apple, they they've been talking about this digital hub thing. I mean, there's like an old uh, 2001 
Digital Hub uh, discussion from Steve Jobs at Macworld. This is what he wanted to do from 2001. This is where we're moving to. And a, a computer's the way to go because it's got a large screen. It's like, oh, yeah, actually, a lot of this stuff sounds like what the rumors are now. It's like it's going to have applications. That's the key to this tele to, to computers at Digital Hub. And the television can well, yeah, easily become Now that. we're doing exactly what this USA Today article did, which is we're just talking about Apple, when we actually have real things coming out at CES. That have captured nobody's imagination. That have existed already, though. Well, but Samsung's going to show stuff off we haven't seen yet. Maybe it will capture your imagination. Give it a chance. Right? I will. Definitely. Sony says uh, that some of their best-selling TVs have been the Google TVs. So hopefully, they're not selling a lot of TVs Hopefully, the they'll be place. showing the new... Okay, maybe that's a fair point. But maybe the new Google TV-enabled Sonys will be more exciting. I Sorry, think Tom. Tom, I just have to interrupt you. Are any of those things designed by Jonathan Ive? <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have seen one in his office. It was no, slick. not interested. No. Not interested. And going back to this article, I'm going to pick it apart slightly. It's like Microsoft, like Samsung, Microsoft isn't out to reinvent the television marketplace. I'm, I'm taking a huge issue with that. With the 360 and their weird contracts with the different cable well, I, I would, cable things. I would interpret that literally. They are not out to in, 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 change the television. Right, like they just wanted the, the box. The display, right. They the, just box the box that has the connect that Whereas with the voice control Whereas the rumor is that everything. Apple's going to build an actual television. But they don't need to make the television. That's the point. Microsoft makes the Xbox. They already have a lot of the technology Actually, that people want. But if Microsoft made a TV with the Xbox built in, wouldn't that be pretty pimp? Well, Sony did it with the PS3, right? They have the PlayStation television that nobody seems very excited about. It's that 24-inch 3D display with active technology, two uh, 1080p images with, with the right glasses. It's kind of an interesting idea. I mean, I think that's kind of a, an, an indicator if people want to marry a game system with that. But the stuff that the Kinect has, if that was in a television, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's... Putting a little camera in there that's paying attention to, or a little mic in there. Sadly, I think your reaction to my attempt to get you excited about current CES television stuff is going to be the major reaction. And I also believe that Apple is not going to, I, I no longer, even though I said it in the prediction show, I no longer believe Apple's going to come out with a television this year. It's going to be 2013, and which means that we are going to continue having to deal with cable television for at least another year. We are not going to get the solution to internet streaming Because TV. Apple's the only company that will solve this problem? Because everyone will ignore the attempts to solve the problem because say, they're all sitting around Apple's waiting to see do. what Apple does. Exactly. I think that was closer to my prediction. Just saying. Just, you're, you're just, saying. just saying. I, I had that prediction. I just didn't say it on the show. <laughs> you just wrote, weren't saying it. I wrote that prediction you down on this post-it note. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, finally, TiVo uh, makes all their money from patents. This is a very short story. Uh, TiVo has won a settlement with AT&T. It's a cross-licensing deal. So actually, TiVo gets to use some of AT&T's patents. AT&T continues to get to use some of TiVo's patents. Uh, TiVo makes most of the money. They get a 50-some million dollar payment. They'll be getting $215 million from AT&T through 2018. They may get more than that based on uh, additional license fee possibilities for AT&T's U-verse DVR. They also get to build some of AT&T's innovation into their TiVos. Uh, they previously got $500 million from Echo Star, and they're in litigation with Verizon. So if you're wondering, like, how does TiVo survive? I don't really hear about too much, you know, hype around their new products. This seems to be the way they're making, they're making their money off licensing at this point. Yeah, I mean, they've been around for almost 15 years now. And it's, that's kind of a scary number if you think about it. Like the TiVo, the first DVR that people really bought. I and mean, there were a lot of competitors out there, and they, they succeed, and they're managing because they had the right patents, it looks like. Because, I mean, Replay TV, that, that didn't pan out at all. A lot of these DVRs didn't pan out, but TiVo's yeah. still around. All right, let's move on to the news views. Ice cream sandwich. You know it landed with the Galaxy Nexus here in the United States anyway, and is now on... 0.6% of devices. Yeah. Wow. According to Google's Good developer job. site. Uh, Google looked at two weeks of data and also found Gingerbread still owns the lion's share of the Android world with over 55%. Yeah, I see what you did there. Yeah, gingerbread lions. Distimo, an app store tracker, says that the Android market reached over 400,000 active apps over the weekend. Mm. Overall, Distimo says that over half a million apps were submitted, and according to the same data, 68% of apps in the market are available absolutely free. The Wall Street Journal reports Kodak could be filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the coming weeks. The company is looking to avoid going to bankruptcy by selling off patents and raising $1 billion in financing. And if those measures fail, Kodak could be looking at auctioning off its 1,100 patents in bankruptcy proceedings. 
Kodak, of course, did not make a statement when contacted by the journal. <laughs> Too broke to make a statement. Cult of Mac reports the story of a Canadian entering the United States using a photograph of his passport on his iPad has been greatly exaggerated. U.S. Customs Field Branch Chief Jenny L. Burke told Cult of Mac that the Canadian in question had a birth certificate as well as a driver's license along with the scan of the passport uh, and emphasized that Canadians would be required to show more than a photograph of a, v of a passport to get into the United States. They'd have to have something like a birth certificate or a driver's license. Developers at XDA Developers publish the Viper Mod Primer that will let you root the Asus Transformer Prime. You'll need to use a Windows machine to get this to work, but a Linux version is promised by Viper Boy, that's a developer. Asus announced it would offer an official unlock tool the other day, but they haven't given a timetable, so for now, this is your best option. Yeah, why wait? And more good things coming out of XDA. Electronista reports that the Amazon Silk browser has been ported to several Android devices thanks to developer TiHi. To use the Silk Browser, you'll need a rooted Android device, root explorer, and an APK. There isn't a full list of compatible, compatible devices yet, but forum members have had success with the Atrix, the Droid X, and the Galaxy Tab. Vox Media, which runs the SB Nation blogs like Viva Alberto's and Athletics Nation, as well as tech news source The Verge, which, you know, we have folks like Joanna Stern and Neelai Patel and, and Josh Topolsky on the show. The information we Great talk stuff. About. Uh, that, that company, Vox Media, that owns all those blogs, has hired three former editors in chief of game properties Chris Grant, formerly of Joystick, Brian Crescente, late of Kotaku, and Russ Pitts, once of Subbrilliant Television and Tech TV, but probably more famously, just left his post as editor-in-chief of The Escapist. Uh, they've also hired several top-notch writers over at Vox Media. Josh Topolsky wrote that The Verge will be taking advantage of all that talent to expand game coverage there as well. Don't remember Russ. I, I do remember him from Tech TV. He had mm -hmm. a famous exit email when he quit. I don't remember him being so blue. That was his so brilliant television years back in the 90s I in see. Austin. Yeah. He was bluer Dif then. Different time. He's less. He's not blue anymore. No. no. <laughs> but does he still wiser. mime? I don't think so. Oh, no. He too talks. Bad. Out he loud. was really he's good. Got a big yeah. mouth. Yeah. <laughs> bad news for the few of you using Cisco's UMI video conferencing solution because it's kind of dead. A Cisco spokesperson told Business Insider that Cisco no longer sells the product to consumers. If you're unfamiliar with what is Cisco UMI, for six hundred dollars and a ten dollar monthly service fee, you could video conference with other UMI. In HD. I've said Umi and Yumi. It's Yumi. It's Yumi. And Oprah. Umi. Uh, Umi, Yumi. I'm it's thinking of Uni, which is a type of fish that's very love different. love that stuff. Uh, me too. If you already use the service, Cisco says that the service will continue. Just yeah, new consumers. Con continue me. <laughs> Umi. Over, over at the Building Windows 8 blog, Microsoft detailed its refresh and reset features in Windows 8. Now, those tools were included in the developer preview, but the post provides details. Refresh is similar to System Restore in that it'll keep your settings and data while effectively giving you a new Windows install. Microsoft says you can use Reset if you're looking to start all over, like you just want to just start all over again, or you want to get rid of your PC. Right there. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. A group of self-confessed pirates, now these are the kind that download things without authorization off the internet, not the kind who board ships, uh, have tried to get their beliefs recognized as an official religion in Sweden. Their request was denied several times, but the Church of Kapamism, which uh, according to uh, Torrent Freak, holds Control-C and Control-V as their sacred symbols, uh, copy and paste, right, mm -hmm. is now approved by the authorities of Sweden as an official religion. Okay, well, when people say things like, it's against my religion... Uh, to not pirate, apparently, Sometimes they can, I don't know, get away with things. If you say, pirating is simply part of my religion, and to deny me my religious, my religious freedom would be uncool of you, Sweden. I mean, is, it, is this like a way to get around mean, laws? It does not mean that copyright infringement is now permitted. Uh, what but does it mean? What, I think what it does is, is, is an attempt for them to try to push the idea of culture, of, of free culture, and say, look, copying should not be against the law. Uh, and, and, and we're going to make it our religion that copying is okay and, and try to spread the gospel of copinism, copamism. Well, I think I saw that about 3,000 people are, are registered copamists. Something like Copimists, that. yeah. Yes. Right. So, mm -hmm. hey, they've got a good group. Best yeah. of luck. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the founders said, we confessional copimists have not only depended on each other in the struggle, but on everyone who is copying information. To everyone with an internet connection, keep copying. Maintain hardline copamy. 
Okay. Well, what do you make not of as this? Cool, not as cool as being a Jedi. In the UK, there's a I know, whole right. um, thing around trying to get Jedi, uh, you know, uh, the Force recognized as an official UK religion. And every year it comes back around, and every year it just fails to get the requisite number of people. So uh, good for the copper mists. It's kind of cool, but not as cool as being a Jedi. It's weird for us because we don't have official religions. There's no way to become an official. I mean, I guess you can, can be a recognized religion. as a charity. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and, and tax purposes. It's, it's, it's moving that from that line from a cult to a recognized religion in the United States. Yeah. Uh, but this is, this is, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say anything about anybody's religion ever, including this one, the Missionary Church of Copymism. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, sad, it's easy to make fun of. It's easy to poke fun of because it's, it's, it's kind of out there. But the point of all of this, the Pirate Bay and Anonymous and everything, is to say some of the things that are currently illegal shouldn't be illegal. Uh, and, and, and when you look at it from that perspective, it's a reasonable philosophical debate to have. And, it, if, and philoso philosophical debates are very close to religious debates. So it's not a big leap, right? All right, fine. You sound like a copimist. Maybe, maybe I'm you a, should join the church. Maybe I'm a, closet, a copimist apologist. Maybe a closet copimist. I I also like. Uh, I mean, on my computer, it's Command C and V. But mm -hmm. uh, you need to, I'm a big a, fan it's of a different that sect, as well. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, we come from the same there's origin. There's a schism it's like already. Old New Testament. Yeah, yeah. The people of the copy. Let's move on to the uh, calendar. <laughs> Razer has just posted a video titled Project Fiona on the promo site PCGamingIsNotDead.com that promises PC gaming on an all-new form factor. We're going to find out what it actually is at CES on January 10th. What could it be? We'll find out. Apple announced it's going to launch the iPhone for us in China and 21 other countries on January 13th. But China is really, really important for Apple. CEO Tim Cook says Apple's growth in China is growing at a feverish pace and that the company has now claimed Apple's number two spot in the list of top revenue countries. Apple's also set to announce their first quarter 2012 earnings in an analyst call Tuesday, January 24th. This is a fiscal quarter that includes the iPhone 4S release back in October, so should be a pretty big one for them. And a pretrial order from the California courts has set the dates for the forthcoming trial between or Oracle and Google over the rights and wrongs of Java's intellectual property rights for March 19th. Let's finish up with what's incoming. incoming. Andre Toshilin, who apparently I met at Podcasters Cross Borders a couple yeah. years ago, uh, wrote in and uh, he was among several people who wrote in and said, I did additional research on the issue of Belarus banning foreign websites. This is what's really happening. According to this doc linked from the Forbes article to the Belarus government website uh, in Belarus, Two policies will be introduced. One, all Internet providers should block access to some 35 websites providing pornographic or violent content. It's 35 specific, mostly porn websites, not the whole Internet. And two, companies that are doing business in Belarus should register their websites in Belarus. Uh, and then uh, he, he kind of deconstructs the Amazon example from the Library of Congress page uh, by saying and you can't buy goods from Amazon.com in Canada. I think the Library of Congress was just using Amazon as an example. Uh, but according to what the Library of Congress and Reporters Without Borders say, yes, it is true that they are not banning uh, you from visiting any foreign websites. But what they're saying, and I, and I haven't read the, the Belarusian pages uh, that Andre is linked to, so they may contradict this, but uh, all businesses must have a .by address if they conduct business in Belarus. All ISPs must register with the government and record all devices connected to the Internet. And all shared Internet resources, and I think this is the source of the confusion, including Wi-Fi and cafes and sharing an Internet connection in a home, must report any websites visited uh, and especially ones that are not within the .by domain. Uh, okay, so, so it's not as if you don't have access. You just aren't going to be private. You can't be private about it. The, yeah, the, the, the state wants the ability to know who went to what websites when, well, essentially. That kind of sucks, too, but... <laughs> It's better than being in the dark completely. Yeah, it's a absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but thanks to Andre and thanks to everyone else who uh, wrote in with the corrections on that. Next email from Roderick Pearson. Hello, TNT crew. Concerning the new EPUB format to be introduced, I teach physics and physical science. At the beginning of every semester, the Copy Center is inundated with course pack submissions and requests. A course pack is supplemental material for the course that includes text and images 
It's relatively low cost, $5. If this new EPUB format allows for the creation of interactive materials, the course packs could undergo a fundamental shift. No longer would links be included to videos and demonstrations of fundamental concepts. The videos can just be embedded in the book. Lab demos can be included to show students what to expect in the lab, how to analyze data. This would be great. The key factor would be that an ordinary person is allowed to create an interactive document document, publish it to a site where the students could download it to their electronic device without having to go through Amazon or Apple, any big vendor. The school would be the host, and then the pricing is the function of the school, and that would make the price hopefully lower. Very good explanation. Thanks for that email. I was a big fan of this idea because I, 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 was, I have a science background, and so when you'd go to the freaking copy center and they didn't have the books, you're like, why don't you just make more copies of it? Well, there, I remember when I was in college, there was a whole controversy over course packets mm -hmm. because they started cracking down on getting copyright approval yeah. for everything. Yeah, people were getting overly cautious at the end of the whole fair use issue. But it, I, I still think this is the future, and I'm really glad when my kid goes to college, you'll be able to get something like this. Last email from Travis in Vancouver, Washington. Washington? Or am I? Yep. Okay. Yep. I didn't know there was one there. Okay, yeah. good. I learned something today. at and crew, I wanted to comment on why Netflix may be pushing all eight episodes of Lilyhammer at once rather than weekly. It may be that they want to set up a scenario that gets them the best analytical data about the show itself. This way, they can see how many people watch all eight episodes consecutively. A steep drop-off from episode one, two, or to three could be a great indication of what we thought of the show. This also would, re would reduce the possibility that the drop-off of viewership was due to the fact that people forgot about the new episodes week to week. I know I do that with the inconsistency. I know I do with the inconsistencies of all the other streaming sites. Just my thoughts. Hey, uh, Will, you you were mentioning that you thought this was pretty much dead on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we've done with Channel Flip, you know, when we've released episodes weekly and when we've released them in batches, we always find that you get more um, sort of take up if you release them all at once, purely because if you like something, you want to watch more of it as quickly as possible. Like if you've been able to get, you know, all 12 episodes of Game of Thrones, like at once, the first day the first episode came out, you would have just binged on them, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, you know, why not? We should do that with Tech News Today. We should just put them all out at once. We what should do, do all of the rest of the episodes for the year? Yeah, exactly, and just put them out yeah. right now. We'll just have to make up what happens, but we can just read up. be more fun. We, we just, we'll need some writers. That's all. All right, uh, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks to everybody who submitted stories on our Reddit. Our subreddit is technewstoday.reddit.com. Got uh, close to 4,000 people in there submitting stories and voting them up and down. Uh, probably the most important thing, letting us know, yeah, I like this story, don't like this story. I want you guys to cover that stuff. We, we look at that every day when we make our rundown. Will Harris, thanks so much for staying up late. Uh, I know it's a little later there in the U.K. And I always appreciate you staying up and hanging out with us. Absolute pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, just so much pleasure you can't imagine. Now, if you can cut <laughs> through all of that pleasure, uh, let us know what a pleasure it is to visit Channel Flip. Uh, you know what? If you go to Channel Flip, you won't get a lot of pleasure. You'll just get like a nice website that tells you what we do. But if you go to the bottom, there'll be a whole bunch of links to all the cool stuff that you can watch elsewhere. And so then your go to Channel Flip, go to the bottom, then click something, and then like go and watch loads of stuff and binge on it like you would... Um, your favorite TV show. And like pleasure will fill your eyeballs as you're watching. Oh, just, just like in a all in your eyeballs will be unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call, leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. I probably shouldn't say O. It's not actually an O. It's 260-TNT-SHOW. That's it for this episode. Jason Heiner joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then. Wow, 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 wow,